Good morning from California. Thank you for participating in this session, Return of the Dirt Girls, today as part of the American Horticultural Society's 28th Annual National Children and Youth Garden Symposium. Before I begin the talk, I would like to thank our diamond sponsor, Ball Horticultural, for their long-standing support of this important annual event. In addition, the gold sponsor, Longwood Gardens, has supported NCYGS for the past three years. Both Ball and Longwood have helped in facilitating our ability to present this year's symposium virtually. So thank you and welcome. My name is Carrie Stroll, and I'm the founder and leader of the School Garden Doctor, a nonprofit established in 2018 to reach the mission of empowering teachers, schools, and communities to grow school gardens that enhance science education, nurture wellness, and foster environmental literacy. And this talk was co-prepared with my collaborator, Amanda Crump, a rock star assistant professor of teaching in international agricultural development at the University of California, Davis, where we met in graduate school. And I'm lucky to know her as a board member, a friend, and a fellow dirt girl. The School Garden Doctor offers three unique programs designed to promote evidence-based practices to sustain school gardens in the 21st century. Today's session focuses on dirt girls which inspires female youth to pursue STEM careers through horticulture. This session will focus primarily on the design and delivery of the program, as well as some of the key features that make it empowering. But to learn more about the theory behind women empowerment more broadly, please visit the session led by Amanda and her graduate students called Lessons from the Field, Pathways for Women in Horticulture. I often write about the Dirt Girls in my blog, so if you find at the end of the presentation you like the ideas, um, I invite you to, to follow me at the School Garden Doctor on WordPress. Our hope for this session is that you take away key ideas about features of the program designed to empower youth and promote gender equity, as well as learn some practical considerations for starting, expanding, or sustaining a program like Dirt Girls over time. So first, we'll start by framing Dirt Girls as a program that addresses the dual barriers of sustaining school gardens and promoting gender equity. I'll talk through and introduce and describe the Dirt Girl way, and we'll highlight key features that empower young women. So these, in my opinion, should be the faces of future scientists. Why, some people may ask. Uh, because when women work in science, science works for women. Yet the most recent average estimate is that women make up only 29% of the STEM workforce worldwide. Research points to many different factors. For example, the Why So Few report from the American Association of University Women lists uh, beliefs about intelligence or prevailing stereotypes, implicit bias, and workplace competition as just a few of the deterrents to women pursuing careers in STEM. And even though school gardens are as old as public education itself, they tend to be underutilized spaces because school personnel don't always know how to design or maintain or integrate them. In addition, school science often lacks solid pedagogy early on, which can limit participation for girls. Yet, with intentional socialization and model apprenticeships, we can break down the barriers to access for girls. Dirt Girls addresses these dual barriers by providing garden-based opportunities to engage in scientific investigation, practice healthy habits, and become environmentally literate in an after-school setting. Dirt Girls initially started as an after-school club focused on maintaining the garden. Um, this was in a particular site where the garden coordinator was lost um, when the, the position was terminated due to lack of funding. What emerged, however, was a powerful model for maintaining the garden while also expanding leadership opportunities to young women. It ended up being a value-added scenario, propping up girls to gain the confidence they need to participate more fully in the science classroom, while also creating model gardeners who, teacher, who help their teachers gain comfort in the garden classroom. So it kind of was a win-win from both sides. But after a couple of years, I realized there was more to the Dirt Girls than just maintaining the garden. So today, Dirt Girls is a long-standing program guided by the eight core values listed here. Girls doing science, developing knowledge, leadership capability, 
teamwork, inclusion, outdoors and gardening, problem solving, and cross-age relationships. We'll return to these after discussing the program implementation, but before I do that, I just want to give you a taste of what the Dirt Girls is like. So in this portion of the presentation, I'll just sort of talk through what a typical Dirt Girl session looks like. Um, typically, we open with an opening circle, <clears throat> move into a teamwork challenge. Um, eventually, there's time for a choice activity, and we always have a closing routine. And today, you'll sort of vicariously experience this Dirt Girl way and reflect on the features that promote agency, leadership, and science identity. So the opening circle. Um, every Dirt Girl session starts this way, and it's not just for the purpose of safety, for example, taking attendance, making sure I know who's present, but it's also to get a read on the group. Um, a lot of different things happen throughout the school day, so this time is used to check in, um, engage in community building activities, and sometimes we'll do something fun like a physical activity um, game or challenge. Um, and that really helps set the stage and kind of let go of whatever has happened in the school day. Um, it's, a, it's another way of bringing mindfulness to the group. And it, the physical activity, um, this photo is showing girls um, doing an activity they love, which is running barefoot in the grass. Um, the grassy area is outside of the school garden. And so it always has, you know, safety precautions, like you have to stay where I can see you and hear you and so forth. But it's something they don't get to do that often, you know, take off their shoes and run barefoot. Um, and this creates positive energy um, by embracing silliness and fun. And on the right-hand side, you see um, a second grader and she's taking attendance. So each girl, regardless of age, takes a turn taking attendance. And this really serves to center the focus of attention on each other and not just me or the mentor as the leader to sort of hold them accountable for active listening and so forth. The majority of the time in the team challenge is spent um, doing some routine garden maintenance. Um, these can include prepping raised beds or starting seeds, um, a tasting or cooking activity, and sometimes other games and projects. But the mentor will identify these tasks ahead of time and then list them on the job board. This has become a, a mainstay of the program. Uh, the girls take turns selecting the task that they feel more comfortable with. And in doing so, they always work in teams that are made up of younger girls and older girls. And the structure of this choice um, really has all girls participate of a very no or low opt-out rate, which is not always um, the case in some after-school programs where kids sort of have um, sometimes the tendency to become somewhat apathetic. So I think the motivators of being in the garden, being with each other, but also sort of expecting this routine and knowing the expectations of working in a team. But kids are asked to collaborate all day, usually in school these days. And so after the teamwork challenge, the girls are given some time to be alone in the garden if they so choose. Um, and they do choose. These include activities like investigation, journaling, nature exploration, or sometimes creativity and art. So what you see in the bottom uh, right-hand corner is um, the equivalent of like a, a fairy house, the girls call it. Um, this is one of their sort of less sciencey 
um, more imaginative kinds of tasks, but they they really just like having some time to engage with their senses and collect artifacts throughout the garden and, and do something creative with them. And so I think it's important to mention that choice means choice, real choice, not false choice. Um, so often we give kids a choice between two things that are still predetermined. Um, and they have to, you know, identify what it is they're going to go do before they do it. But, you know, so it's sort of subject to approval, but just to make sure that it's safe and inclusive and um, adheres with the core values. Um, sometimes girls choose to work alone. Um, these two girls are just having a grand old time um, shucking strawberry popcorn uh, to prepare for a popcorn party. And um, the core values are used to guide this choice within those safe boundaries, as I said. And so what you see here is a journal um, entry about what core value meant the most to this young lady that day. Um, she said she appreciates gardening, outdoors and gardening, because she lives in an apartment. It has a tiny patio. So when I get to Dirt Girls, it's a chance for me to develop the knowledge of gardening and science. Finally, each session closes with a reflection. The reflection um, could be reflecting back on core values and how we um, embodied those in that day. It could be a gratitude circle. Sometimes we use this time to make plans, um, address anything that came up during the session, and sharing knowledge. Maybe during your choice activity, you learned something really cool or found something really cool. So this becomes kind of a show and tell. Um, and it's not just for the sake of structure, it's also how we bring awareness to the things that we've accomplished and holds the kids accountable, the participants are accountable to meet the logistical demand um, of getting kids ready um, for departure. So when parents come to get them, a lot of girls will stay longer than the scheduled time, but only after we've closed the group so that, you know, <clears throat> there's a sense of, of closure and, and community. And um, for example, this was me showing the poster of the core values and asking the girls to share out or comment on which core values they stood for today. And on the bottom right, you see celebrating our accomplishments. Once in a while, um, we'll take group photos. Actually, quite often, we'll take group photos. Um, and this day, they were painting um, birdhouse gourds, gourds, I believe. So I'm going to ask you to just pause and reflect here for a moment before we go into sort of the ways that a program like this can empower women or girls, and more generally speaking, how we empower women and girls worldwide. So I'm going to pause and ask you to just take a few minutes to jot down some notes. Think about one way that your current programming can bring more awareness to the ways that structure um, can empower women. And if during this time, feel free to pause and take longer if you'd like, but during this time, I'd also like to just say if something came up for you that um, you have a question about or that you wanted to share with us, I in, um, encourage you to join the live chat session, which is Thursday, July 9th from 3 to 3.30 Eastern Standard Time. So I look forward to possibly meeting you then. So. One of the things that makes me really lucky to have the contributions of someone with Amanda's background on my board is that you know she has this deep um, theoretical history around um, gender empowerment worldwide in the context of agriculture and um, development overall, like developing countries. Um, and so she was able to compile a, a short list of things that, you know, some of them are more specific to international development work, but some also are equally applicable to the scale of one school garden and then one program like Dirt Girls. And so she suggests that some ways to empower women and girls worldwide are to create safe spaces for just women and girls, um, address equity, through improving the enabling environment. And, and that's something she can speak to a little more on the chat if you're able to join, um, because it's a little more germane to international agricultural development. But these last three really apply to any context, improving educational opportunities, but explicitly for women and girls, discussing health, especially disparities in health, access to health care, choice, um, and then assessing and developing indicators for empowerment. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that aspect of the program, as well as some of the challenges that have come up 
um, over the, sev the several years that I've been offering it. So creating a program and implementing it is one thing. Um, growing it as a nonprofit, I've found, is, is sort of another. Um, so even though the program model seeks to overcome these dual barriers of gender equity and s school garden sustainability, it's not without its challenges. And so one of the challenges is just the sort of articulation of gender segregated programming or, or how that is received um, to the general public. So for example, at um, the school where this program originated, after a couple of years of, of really gaining momentum and success and kind of a reputation for it being a very inclusive environment, um, I had a parent of a male student ask the principal, you know, where is the program for boys? And, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, one thing to articulate, you know, well, it's after school, it's not required to be co-educational, you know, there's not really a precedent for gender segregated programming in public education. Um, and that's actually, you know, I think one of the reasons girls have fewer opportunities to access STEM overall. Um, so we really had to kind of talk about, and, and I had to really um, reflect on that. And I did um, sort of change the model a little bit for one year, opened it up, called it Dirt Kids, um, and it didn't have the same draw. And so by the end of the school year, the garden was kind of, you know, not as well maintained. Um, and, you know, there wasn't the same, um, like, established relationship between the mentor, um, myself, and the kids. And so I really just decided that I would articulate the rationale. And that's when I began to offer it in the um, format of a nonprofit, because then I could say, well, this is the mission of the nonprofit, and this is how this program meets the mission. And so you can have this program at your school or not. Um, but also, I changed the description so that it is youth, you know, regardless of gender identity, um, you know, any, any child can join, um, but it is called Dirt Girls because I just felt the, you know, after looking at national models, um, such as the Girl Scouts of America, Girls on the Run, the National Girls Collaborative Project, I, I felt like I, I felt empowered to say like, nope, this is a program for girls and it explicitly focuses on um, promoting equity in STEM. And I would like boys to be behind that too, or any child of any gender identity. So, you know, in the increasingly pluralistic and, and gender neutral society, I think it's really important to maintain inclusivity, but also, you know, have those discussions. And so we do have that talk that was um, one of our talks that we had during um, a closing reflection one time. Um, another challenge is the site selection and maintenance. So um, starting at one school was pretty easy. It, it kind of, we had a structure already for after school programming. Um, as I've moved from a six week cycle to an eight to 10 week cycle, it's been a little bit off for getting kids enrolled and signed up. So it's important that the site have buy-in and that they have enough infrastructure. They don't have to have the whole built environment, but they have to have enough that there's something for the girls to really authentically interact with. And then those personnel systems that manage the enrollment, those are um, critical. I'm a very small organization, and so the ability to manage more than one site um, becomes really difficult over time, handling things like payment, um, waivers, anything like that. And, and there are some good models out there that I look to, Girls on the Run being one of them. But um, I really, so far, I'm partnering with organizations that are able to do that work, and then I bring the program work. And then, of course, with all programs, funding and ongoing support from the community. So as I mentioned, one of the major challenges was maintaining contact and staying in communication with parents, especially during the shelter in place order that happened this past spring. I was about halfway through the winter session and you know, a couple weeks away, just two weeks away from signing up for the spring session where I was also bringing on um, someone to lead a program at another site. And so because I couldn't offer programming, I wanted to send the girls something, some materials that would keep them connected to their inner dirt girl. And I reached out to parents through whatever means I could, um, eventually getting the principal's permission to ask the bilingual liaison to call the homes and ask permission to give me their addresses. And so that was definitely one of the challenges of working outside of the school system versus inside of the school system. Um, it ultimately took me about eight weeks to send out 12 of these 
Um, I called them Dirt Girl Survival Packs. And you can see they're just a collection of materials to kind of um, give them some activities to do to get outside and, and get dirty. Um, and during the call, I showed them a video, um, the video that was in the beginning of this presentation <clears throat> and talked with them. And specifically, um, I was inviting the four girls who were moving on to middle school next year. And so those are the, the girls you see in the picture, um, including the intern or the, the mentor apprentice who was working with me. And I, I asked them, like, what, what does empowerment look like to you? You know, as I said, you know, I had examples and photos and um, the girls really were not necessarily equipped um, to explain what empowerment looks like, but they seem to know it when they see it or, or when they feel it. And so, you know, there's a lot of reasons why they maybe couldn't articulate it. Maybe their age, maybe I hadn't seen them in so long, maybe the medium. Um, but overall, I also think it's really hard to define. And so that's another thing that Amanda brings to the work. Um, I value her guidance because she knows about how to evaluate programs like this. She's taught me about researchers who design methods for eliciting cultural explanations of what empowerment looks like. And I have an interest in adapting this for the program. So there, here was one example. This photo show, shows a team of girls who worked tirelessly to pull out a long mallow root. I think it shows what empowerment looks like, you know. And um, uh, this came from many talks with Amanda about, you know, what are some of the ways of eliciting what empowerment looks like in a community, especially a community um, where women are are perhaps even more um, at odds um, with the accessibility of their um, environment, of the marketplace, of career, of education, of health, and all of those kinds of things. And so um, I just think, you know, this is a starting point. And so I encourage people to collect these artifacts, collect artifacts of empowerment, so that you can kind of develop a way of evaluating your progress. And um, these are just a few um, sort of <laughs> the one on the bottom right. I mean, right now, it just makes me go, ah, like, all hands in the bowl, but of course, right now we wouldn't do that. Um, some of that will change, and um, really having the the pictures, the drawings, the writings, the the things that really make this experience stand out and stick with them. Um, and I think it's also important to be realistic about what um, what is part of the program and what is part of the larger society. And so, you know, the weekly program structure was just one of the features that makes your girls successful. Um, but an underlying contribution is this um, really embracing an apprenticeship model. And many of the participants who joined Dirt Girls already have other role models. You know, maybe their parent works in science. I mean, many of them ended up coming to Dirt Girls through another club. You know, maybe their older sister participated, or maybe they were in a club with me in kindergarten or first grade. But there's something to be said for the mentoring relationship. I, it wasn't until I ran the program for a few years and had some of these girls that stayed in it for years that I really started to recognize the impact that that mentorship had. And only when I founded the nonprofit did I realize that to grow the program, I also had to grow mentors. And so I offer what I call a mentor apprenticeship internship. Um, I recruit someone who's already working in the school garden setting and then lead them to learn the program structure through a 10-week experiential learning um, opportunity. And um, I underwrite that cost with fundraising, but work with I work with the sponsoring organization or site to adapt a revenue model that can sustain it. And so I just I call this sort of apprenticeship model multiplied. Um, there's peer apprenticeship, as I talked to, there's parent apprenticeship, there is apprenticeship from mentors or other people, um, science mentorship. Um, I've invited female scientists from the community. Um, in the picture on the bottom right, there's a um, flower uh, researcher with the Resource Conservation District, an ornithologist, and then the city of Napa community um, recycling specialists. So, you know, lots of different ways. And then also getting the girls out in the community. So in the upper right-hand photo, we are um, there on a Saturday working in a community garden that grows food for the food bank. So really kind of paying it forward and, and seeing how they're received and building their confidence, interacting in all kinds of different environments. One more feature I didn't talk about is STEM projects. And these are sort of seasonal forays that engage the girls in engineering design, solving real world problems, and taking environmental action. Um, one of my favorite ones is um, 
making uh, DIY beeswax sandwich wraps. Um, if you've not seen these, they're um, marketed as an alternative to the plastic baggie. And if you have ever had lunch at a school, you will see that the plastic baggie, the single use plastic baggie, the Ziploc bag is ubiquitous. Um, and so this came about um, as just a sort of a project I was thinking about to teach a little bit about um, reducing you know, waste in the landfill while doing making something really pretty, but also something that was ex financially accessible because you can find these um, in the marketplace, but they're they're pretty pricey, so not everyone can afford them. Um, and I don't think environmentalism should be something that you have to only attain through your pocketbook. And so we made a mixture of the sort of the beeswax, melted beeswax solution that you paint sort of spread onto these fabric pieces. Um, we had to do it multiple times to learn the process. But in the end, we ended up making um, 50 of these squares. And um, several girls came with me to the November farmer's market um, in our community to sell them at a holiday bazaar, sort of a, an event that was showcasing local products for sale for the holidays. And they just, they loved this. They they loved this um, project. They loved engaging in it. And so this is just one of the things that will be offered on what is a forthcoming resource called the Dirt Girl Deck. Um, as I realized not being able to um, start a program at another site and build my apprenticeship uh, model with mentors, I decided I needed a way to um, sort of collect and house and write down some of the activities that could be successful, but also to kind of have, have a go-to. You know, this is not a program that requires a lot of lesson planning. And you really just need more of a disposition, knowing how to understand the rationale for the program, but how to be with the kids. Um, and so the Dirt Girl deck will be a collection of activity cards divided into suits, um, sort of like a deck of cards, of playing cards, um, with about 10 to 12 activities for each of the four segments of a typical Dirt Girl session. So, you know, the um, opening circle, team challenge, choice activity, and closing routine, um, and then about three or four seasonal projects. And one example, um, I, it's interesting how this came to me. Um, on the left-hand side is an activity we actually did last fall. Um, we spelled out thank you in found materials from the garden, and kids had to work in teams, collect those bits, and then make their letter. And we were making this so I could photograph it and send it to all of our donors. We had a successful fundraising campaign um, that I talk about in my other talk, Crowdfunding Successes and Challenges. Um, and so the girls did this as, as a way of, of showcasing um, their gratitude. And recently on Instagram, um, this is at Mountain Talk posted this lovely Black Lives Matter um, post. And, and I just thought it was so beautiful. I want to give her full credit there. Um, and it made me think, oh, like that could be an activity. You know, that is an activity. And so collecting bits from nature and creating words of empowerment, right? Coming back to that idea of how do we measure this? And um, I recently had the idea of um, or the opportunity to get a donation of a GoPro camera. And so thinking about how do we capture these moments in ways that are sort of non-traditional um, outside the box of you know, a survey or even an observation. So like I said, collecting the artifacts and then using those to both develop the program and evaluate the program. And so it's really no surprise that that the participants in this program are empowered outside of the program as well as inside of the program. And so I don't in any way take full credit for that. Um, and I, at this point, have no idea how I will track whether or not these girls make it in STEM. But a program that crosses these boundaries of place, um, making safe spaces in multiple places, in school, out of school, at home, in the community, um, that is something that promotes the success. And I just thought this was really interesting. On this particular day, three girls had, you know, sort of their empowerment. They were wearing it on their on their bodies, right? Um, one girl has a t-shirt that says, the future is equal. Another says, girl, a kind, smart, modern day game changer. And then another young lady has girls on the run. And so again, you know, what should a, a dirt girl be like or look like. I, I look to these um, national models that I mentioned earlier and, you know, I've started engaging some of the older um, participants in thinking about what would, what would our logo look like um, if we designed one.
specifically for jerk girls. So I really hope that you know you've enjoyed something or took something away from this talk. If you have any questions at all, I encourage you to reach out to me. Um, there is my email. I've also recently developed a link tree. So all of the links to my social media, um, the WordPress blog, I'm on Pinterest, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And you can find me um, at the School Garden Doctor. And just one more plug to join the live chat, chat on Thursday, July 9th. If that has already passed, like I said, please don't hesitate to reach out. It has been a pleasure to spend this last 30 minutes or so with you, and I really hope you enjoy the rest of your conference or virtual symposium. And good luck in all of the work you're doing. Um, thank you so much.